Here's one that you probably don't normally think about, but you may have asked yourself this next question in the past. If you have asked yourself this question, it's probably because you've felt bombarded by software products asking you to update them. Let me show you what I mean. I recently started up a computer that I hadn't used for a while, and as soon as I fired it up, my software started prompting me with things like this. My password manager was out of date. Would I like to download the new version? Skype popped up as well. There was a new version of Skype. The VPN product I used, that also wanted an update. And even the product that I used to take these screen grabs asked me to update it. There were all sorts of different software products on the machine begging for new versions to be loaded. Many people will wonder why this happens. And indeed, they'll wonder if it really matters. What if I say, ignore it, will it go away? And are there any negative consequences from not taking the update? Let's start by having a look at some of the reasons software is continually asking for updates like these. I want to talk about three primary reasons why we keep seeing messages like the ones we just saw on the previous slide. The first is that very often software does get new enhancements. It's improved. There'll be a new feature or something will run more efficiently. The software manufacturer has improved the product and they want to give you the latest version. This is usually a good thing. Another reason, and this is a very common one for software updates, is bug fixes. So something within the software product has not been working properly and they've fixed it. Now it may not be something that you've seen, it may not be an obvious flaw, it may not be one in a feature that you use. Very often, these flaws only expose themselves under very specific circumstances. The reality is that software can be very complex. There are a lot of moving parts, a lot of lines of code, a lot of interdependencies, and bugs are inevitable. All software has bugs. And if a manufacturer is coming forth and saying, hey, we've fixed some stuff, and there's an update, then that is also normally a very good thing. But there's a third item, and this is particularly relevant to this course, and that's security flaws. Because software is so complex, not only do we have bugs that might impact, say, functionality, we have bugs that can leave software vulnerable. Now, these security flaws can come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. They can have very different risks. At best, it may be nothing more than a minor inconvenience. At worst, it may mean your personal data being compromised or attackers even taking control of your PC. That's usually about as bad as it gets with security flaws. And we have seen this time and time again too. We've seen very serious security flaws in very well-known software. Let me give you an example. This is a list of just very recent security vulnerabilities in the Java runtime environment. Now you may have used Java in your browser before. Not so much these days, but particularly in the past, there are many websites that were dependent on running Java within your web browser. And it has a long history of having some pretty serious security vulnerabilities. It's not just Java, we've seen security vulnerabilities with Adobe Flash, with Microsoft Silverlight, and not just with software that runs in your browser, but pretty much any software you can conceive of. The big problem though with vulnerable software that does run in your browser is it leaves you open to vulnerabilities that can be exploited just by visiting a website. Now this is one of the big reasons that Java and Flash and Silverlight are disabled in modern browsers. Those plugins left us especially vulnerable. And we're now reaching a point in time where we just simply don't need them. The thing to leave you with on this slide though, is that when people did not keep these products up to date, they face some really serious risks that could manifest themselves simply by browsing a website. 
But let's move on. Let's talk about how we stay on top of this. So how do we keep our software up to date? How do we maintain it? Let's go and talk about updates. Here's a really good example. And if you're a Windows user, you may have seen this. Then again, you may not have because the beauty about the way Windows updates itself is it happens very seamlessly in the background. For many years, Windows has had the Windows Update Facility. And this is a process that regularly checks to see if there is new software available that can be installed on your PC. When there is, it will begin downloading and installing. And very often, this happens silently. So that is, it doesn't require any interaction from you. You may have noticed sometimes when you reboot your PC, it says that the system is updating. If you leave your PC turned on long enough without rebooting, you may actually be asked to restart it in order for the installation to complete. This is a great way of taking security updates because they don't require interaction. Let's look at another model. It's really important that any sorts of updates, whether they're fixes for security or bug fixes or new features, happen seamlessly. The way Apple does it with iOS is excellent. This is the way my iPhone is configured. I have it set up to automatically take updates to apps. Now we just saw in the previous slide how Windows was updating the operating system. This is an example of every application on the device being regularly updated. What I love about this is that when I've got iOS set to take updates, I go to bed, my phone is on power, it's on the Wi-Fi, and it just happens in the middle of the night. Most of the time, I don't even know it. And this is one of the great things about software updates today as compared to years gone by. It used to be that every update was a very manual process, required planning and testing. And as a result, it frequently didn't happen. These days, it literally happens while you sleep. It should happen while you sleep. Make sure that your apps are updating. So far, I've just been talking about operating systems and apps and software that we're all probably pretty familiar with. But increasingly, we're seeing software running in places that we've never seen it before. IoT, or the Internet of Things. This is the premise that we should start connecting everything to the Internet because Internet makes them better. And in many cases, it does. There are some really excellent devices out there that are better by virtue of connectivity. But it also poses all new problems. So for example, you're looking at Lifex light bulbs. And the Lifex light bulbs had a bit of a security problem. There was a bug that would expose the Wi-Fi passwords of the network that it was connected to. Now, this is a serious bug in the software of the light globes. So it needed a fix. And this should now start to get you thinking. How do you update your IoT things? So have a think about the sorts of IoT devices that you may well have in your home. Things like webcams. Have you ever updated your webcam software? Do you know how your webcam updates its software itself, if at all? Webcams are a particularly common source of pretty serious security vulnerabilities. Is it actually being maintained? Smart TVs are another very popular IoT device in the home. How are they being maintained? Not just maintained now either, but Think about how long you expect your TV to last. Will the software still be maintained when the TV's seven years old? Maybe a decade old? That could leave you quite vulnerable. Thermostats are another very popular IoT device these days. Do you know how your thermostat is updating its software? Could your thermostat be doing the same thing as the Lifex light bulb and leaking the credentials to your Wi-Fi network? Wi-Fi power switches are another good example. I've got one on my coffee machine so that it turns itself on in the morning before I get up. I recently updated the software running on it. 
And the only way I could do it was to open the app on my mobile device. And that's not something I normally do. It was only when I opened the app one day to change a setting that I realized that it actually needed a software update. Security systems in the home is another one. We're seeing all sorts of physical security devices now connected to the internet. How do you update those? And just for one more example, cars. We are seeing cars become part of the Internet of Things. They run software, they talk over the Internet, and occasionally they're going to have bugs as well. How does your car update its software? Let me show you one example. This is the software update on a Tesla. And in fact, what's happening here is that within the vehicle, you can define when that software update is applied. Now, we almost need to take a step back here and remember just how far we've come. This is a car that connects over the internet and downloads new versions of software to do all three of those things we just saw before. Add new features, fix bugs, and resolve security problems. It can be configured to talk to your Wi-Fi, take those updates outside of normal operating hours, apply them while you're sleeping, and then be ready to run when you get up and use it. This is a great example of how seamlessly our IoT things can update themselves. But do take a moment just to think about how many other devices you've got in your house that may not be updating themselves at all, that may actually be vulnerable and leave you at risk. So that's software maintenance. It's not a particularly glamorous part of security, but it certainly is an important one. Let's now move on and start talking about mobile devices.